No, I'm not just completely accepted. That's the first fingerprint. Number two, I'm extremely valuable. This is better than even acceptance. We all want to be accepted, but we want more than acceptance. We want to be valued. And so God says, I don't just accept you, I value you. You're not just completely accepted, you're extremely valuable. In fact, you are priceless. Many of you know that I, I collect old books. In fact, I started when about 14 or 15. I've always been a reader, and, and today because I've collected books and used bookstores all around the world and I find little bargains, I have over 20,000 volumes in my library. Some of those books are 300, 400, 500 years old. Now, when I go online and I'm searching for a, a used book, it will tell me the condition. And some of the books will say, These books, this book is acceptable. And others will say, this book is very good. This one is fine. This one is very fine. And this one is like new. Well, if I have a choice between a book that's acceptable and a book that is very fine, I'm choosing the book that's very fine in its condition. Because it's priceless. It's worth more. And the same is true about you. You're not just acceptable, you're extremely valuable. Now Paul's second, or Peter's second description of your true identity is this. He says, you are a holy nation and a people belonging to God. Circle holy and belonging. Because both of those words imply extreme value. You are holy. What does holy mean? It means you're valuable. When we talk about the holy Bible, it's extremely valuable. When we talk about the holy land, the holy city, the holy sepulcher, the holy of holies, anything that, that is holy is considered more than normal. It's unusual. It's extremely valuable. And God says, you, you, your true identity is you're holy. To God, you are extremely valuable to God. You're not just acceptable, you are valuable. And your value is to the extreme in that you are priceless. Now, what is it that makes something valuable? Well, there are a couple things. The first thing that makes something value, valuable, that determines its value, is who owns it. Because things that are owned by famous people are more valuable than things that are not owned by famous people. In other words, uh, if you saw some tennis shoes or basketball shoes for sale uh, in a used store, and one of them said these were Rick Warren's shoes and these were LeBron Bron James shoes, <coughs> you're going to go after the LeBron James tennis shoes, okay? Because they're more valuable because he owned them. If you put your car up for sale, <coughs> and in the penny saver, right next to it was Lady Gaga's car. I guarantee you they wouldn't be the same price because some people would pay more money for a car owned by her. If you went out and you bought a bed uh, for a couple hundred dollars, you would pay a whole lot more for it if it was a bed that President Lincoln slept in. It was his bed. <coughs> I collect some rare documents that I've collected over the years. I've got one letter that today um, is extremely valuable because it was handwritten and it was handwritten about separation of church and state between the government and the government has no business in the rights of the church and it's handwritten by a guy named Thomas Jefferson. It'd be worth about a million bucks if I sold it today. Why? Because it's a letter? No, because who wrote it? because who was the owner of that letter? The owner often adds value to very common things. So here's the question, who do you belong to? Who's your owner? If God's your owner, you're extremely valuable. I am owned by the King of Kings. I belong to the King of Kings. I'm holy and I belong in the people of God. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says this, you are a people holy to the Lord. In other words, very valuable, set apart to the Lord your God. His treasured possession. Did you know that when God looks at you, he didn't go, oh no, I created that person? <laughs> you, you gotta be kidding me. What was I thinking when I did that person? When God looks at you, he sees you as his treasured possession. Nobody values you more than God. Nobody. The Bible says this in Isaiah 43, 4. God says, you are precious to me. Now your parents may have never called you precious, but God does. God says, you are 
precious to him. You are holy, you are extremely valuable. Now why am I extremely valuable? Well there are two reasons, you might write these down. The first reason is because God is my father. And if God is my father, and I'm in his family, then I own part of the family inheritance. One day in heaven, he's gonna share all of his glory and all of the universe with me. I didn't say that, the Bible says it. God is gonna share everything he has with his children. God wanted children. And because I'm a child of God, I'm extremely valuable. Now, everybody is created by God, but not everybody is a child of God. Everybody is created by God, everybody's loved by God, but you gotta choose to be in God's family, and a lot of people choose not to be in God's family, not to trust in the Son, the Savior Jesus, and not to believe in him. And so what, so he's saying that when God is my father, God says then I'm gonna take care of all your needs. When my kids are little, I take care of all their needs. They don't have to worry about where the money's gonna come from. My kids came and asked me for money all the time. They never said, I wonder if dad's gonna have that. They just come and ask. Now the Bible says this in Luke 12. Jesus says, look at the birds. God feeds them and you're far more valuable to him than any birds. Now if anybody's on God's welfare roll, it's birds. <laughs> they don't do a whole lot except chirp and poop. And, and, and God says, I take care of the birds and you're far more valuable, underline that. You're far more valuable to me than any birds. God is my father. The second reason why I'm extremely valuable is because Jesus gave his life for me. That shows my value. Jesus gave his life for me. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I'm just junk. Jesus did not die for junk. You're not junk, so stop saying that. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7, you have been bought and paid for by Christ, so you belong to him. He paid for you with his life's blood. Now, what is it that determines something's value? First, who owns it? And the second thing that determines the value is, what is somebody willing to pay for it? How much is your home worth? Not as much as you think it is. <laughs> All right, not as much as you think it is. I'll tell you, without even being a real estate agent, I can tell you exactly what your home is worth. It's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. And not a penny more. You might think your home is worth more. It's not. Your home is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. If I hold up a, 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 an old rookie a Honus Wagner baseball card, one of the most rarest baseball cards around, I say, how much is this worth? It's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. If I hold up a piece of art, how much is this worth? It's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. How much are you worth? Look at the cross. This is how much you're worth. How much God paid to save you. Jesus, when he raises his hands out on the cross and they nail his head out, he says, this is how much you're worth, this much. I'd rather die than live without you. I am willing to die and shed my blood for you. That's how much you're worth. If you wanna know how valuable you are, you look at the cross. Those people who told you when you're growing up, you're not worth anything, you're not important, and in so many ways they said to you, you don't matter as much as your sister does or your brother does or whatever does. You don't really matter that much. They were lying. They were lying. Because you are not only completely acceptable to God through Christ, but you are extremely valuable to God because of what Christ did for you. The greatest ransom ever paid in the history of humanity was paid to ransom you by God when he gave his own son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place for your sins so you don't have to die in, his, in your place for your own sins. Christ gave his life for you. So I'm completely accepted, but I'm also extremely valuable. Now the third fingerprint in your true identity is this, I'm eternally loved. I am eternally loved. Loved. 
I'm completely accepted, I'm extremely valued, and I am eternally loved. Now the third thing Peter says about your true identity is this. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you didn't have an identity, you didn't have much of an identity, but now you're the people of God. This has profound implications. Because God says, now you're in my family. God says, I'm not ashamed of my family. You know, in our human way, we're often ashamed of people in our families. You know, those weird uncles or aunts or brothers or sisters, parents, kids. Don't look at them. You know who I'm talking about. Okay. And, and we're often ashamed of relatives. God is not ashamed of his family. And he will never, 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 never be ashamed of you. Other people might be ashamed of you. God will never be ashamed of you. Because he says, you're in my family. And God wanted you in his family. And he chose you to be in his family. In fact, the Bible says this, here on the screen. Jesus and the ones he makes holy, that's you, that's me. Jesus and the ones he makes valuable to God, extremely valuable, have the same father. Why are we valuable? Because we belong to God. And that is why Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Do you realize that when you get to heaven, God's got, Jesus is gonna say, hey bro. Hey sister, how's it going? He said, well, no, no, God, Jesus isn't gonna call me his sister. That's what the Bible says. He is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Did you realize that? That's the kind of love God has for you. That's the kind of love Jesus has for you. He's not ashamed to call you his brother and sister to identify with you. Jeremiah 33, 31 verse three says this. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. I mean, that, that, that an end. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Now there are two characteristics of God's love that I want you to memorize. Because if you forget these, you're gonna let other people steal your identity. If you don't realize these, you're gonna get sucked off into performance mentality. Two things about God's love for you. Number one, it's unconditional, and number two, it is unending, it's constant. Unconditional and unending, it is constant. You might circle that. It says there, I have loved you everlasting and unfailing. First, it's unconditional, that means not I love you if you pray, I love you if you do good, not I love you if you please me, not I love you, not I love you because you're a nice person, not because you go to church, because you tithe, because you help the poor, not, not, not I love you because, but I love you, period. In fact, unconditional love is I love you in spite of you. Now, you know why we have a hard time with that? because you have rarely experienced unconditional love. You may have experienced a few moments in your life of unconditional love, but no one, no one, no human being loves unconditionally all the time, because we're all broken. So your parents didn't always love you unconditionally, there were conditions at times. And you don't love unconditionally all the time. You remember when you were in, in, in uh, junior high and you write a note, and it's I love you if, no, I love you if you love me. That's not love. I love you if you love me, what? That's a conditional love. I love you if you please me. I love you if you go to the prom with me. I love you if you go to bed with me. That's not love, that's lust. I love you if is conditional love, it's not real love. And then I love you because is not real unconditional love. When you write a, a, sweet, a note to your sweetheart and say, I love you because you're so beautiful. Well, what happens when they lose their beauty? <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but most of you have already lost it. <laughs> okay? I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you've already lost it. I'm sorry. Okay? I mean, I'm not the hunk of burning love I used to be. Okay? Now, I'm still sexy, I know that, but I mean. <laughs> but really, if you say, I love you for your beauty because you're beautiful, that's conditional love. I, because all of our beauty fades eventually. 
You might be in an accident. How about, I love you because you meet my needs. What if they can't meet your needs anymore? Does you stop loving them? I love you because you support me. What if all of a sudden they're disabled and they become an invalid? Do you stop loving them? A lot of people do. And they walk away and they divorce. I love you because you, you do all these things for me. That's not love, that's selfishness. I love you, period. I love you in spite of yourself. I love you regardless of what you do for me. I love you. That's real love. That's the kind of love God has for you. It's unconditional, period love. But it's not only unconditional, it's unending. In other words, it's consistent. God isn't fickle. God isn't unpredictable. God doesn't have bad hair days. God isn't moody. God doesn't get up on the wrong side of the bed. Some of you grew up with a, with a dad who you never knew if he was gonna hug you or slug you. And, and you never knew, was he gonna be mad or is he gonna be sad or glad, poke you or stroke you or you know whatever, criticize you or build you up. And, and, and that creates, you know, unstable parents create in, instable, unstable children. Insecure children. And, and, and God says, no, no, my love for you is consistent. It is unending. It is everlasting. It is unfailing. You never need to ask, is God going to love me today? Did I do enough? Did I pray enough yesterday? Did I tell somebody about Jesus? Did I give a big enough gift? Did I help somebody? Did I, did I hold my temper? Did I stop? cussing. God, God is never going to, you never have to say, Does God, is God going to love me today? You can't make God stop loving you. God's never going to love you one ounce more than he does right now, no matter what you do. God's never going to love you one ounce less than he does right now, no matter what you do. Because God's love is not based on you, it's based on him, who he is. And we always get into trouble when we doubt God's love. Now, why Am I eternally loved? Write this down. Because God is love. The reason I'm eternally loved is because God is love. It doesn't say he has love, he is love. It is his character. The only reason love is in the universe is because the creator of the universe is love. If God was not a loving God, you would be incapable of love. There would be no love in the universe. It all comes from our creator. God is love. You take God out of the picture, there is no love. There is no love. Because love is of God. God is love. So his character isn't gonna change, so his, his love for you isn't gonna change. Psalm 100 verse five says this. God's love is eternal. And his faithfulness lasts forever. You may be unfaithful to him. He's not going to be unfaithful to you. Because God's love is eternal and his faithfulness lasts forever. So, I'm completely accepted. And, and I am extremely valuable. And I am eternally loved. That's my true identity. Tom will talk about the fourth fingerprint. Fingerprint. 